пекло на, на землі. Во ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа. Амінь. Во ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа. Амінь. Во ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа. Амінь. Отче наш. Порою ми знаходимо пам'ятники в наших населених пунктах, де є надписи «Очі громадяни, односелчі чи одноміщани загинули в період Другої світової війни, ну, так званої вітчизняної війни. Знизу ще є невеличкий список, а чи загинули від рук українські буржуазні націоналістів. Значить, саме ті, котрі погинули, я не хочу сказати, що на 100% так. Це в основному люди, котрі були вербовані НКВД, йшли, продавали своїх сусідів. Хто з розрахунку, що його дитина десь поступить після в інститут, кому обіцяли посаду, а хто просто за юден гріш. І таких людей нищили безпощадно. І так от, і, і більшість у них є жовщок, і всіх відпити, бо видно закупали жив'ю. Я, я вам все. говорю, от чотири місці, ну, всі, я, всі, я всі, сиділа в 48 році. Як би поголовно всі. Менш, більш всі відкриті. І там є, коли вони хотіли то зложити на німців, то значить, що вони, е, е, хлопці, де, чи комісія то визвала, що наша пуля совєтська. Совєтська пуля, в серці. В серці. В серці. Якщо вони хотіли, то зложити, то німці зробили. що то німці зробили. Кажу, маєш думати, майже, майже кажу, кажу, муля в череп. Кажемо. Або задушили. Але якби може задушили, то він би все одно мав рот, рот запити, а то всі е, е, повідкривані. Та може бідні кричали, рятувалися, як могли. Може їх живьом кидали, і вони там е, е, рятувалися, і так там, і, і, та, і та, той смертю там загинув. Мій брат аж, на, аж на Уралю був, і він там пропав, Свердловську. Остапного не і звідси забрали. сюди, і звідси сюди, кадем разі чи? Остапного не на його забрали, в сороковим першому році. Ну, так, ну я за що і говорю. І його забрали. Це вже не цього, це ліктова кисть. Ні, ні, цього, давай вже... Поки що його не розкривай, не розкривай поки що його. Бо він не пронумерований, значить, їдь далі просто. Це ще один номер має бути. Це буде вже восьмий тоді, на цьому ряді тільки. Так, восьмий вже восьмий второпував. Він сподарував, а там буде вставити сім А. Щоб це не була робота НКВД, то би давно підняли, вже відкрили кримінальну справу. А саме головний доказ цього, що це не НКВД, Радянська влада обов'язково би це вже сказала, це бандери це зробили, чи це поляки зробили, чи це німці. Це була пропаганда. Просто була б відкрита вже кримінальна пропаганда. справа, вона по сьогоднішній час не відкрита. Знаєш, йде порушення закону. А це говорить про те, що кому-то не вигідно, щоб оцей злочин був розкритий. Тому що ті люди, напевне, живуть, і якщо вони вже не працюють в органах НКВД, то їхні діти працюють, і всі вас силами стараються оцей злочин закрити. Thank <laughs> you. 
After two weeks, the dig was completed. 62 skeletons had been found. A criminal investigation was promised by the Soviet authorities. With the collapse of the communist system, the prospect of the perpetrators being put on trial has become real. Ставлення до цього питання, напевно, однозначне. Якщо був німберський процес, повинен бути процес, чи він буде називатись Варшавським, чи Київським, чи Московським. По крайній мірі, моральний осуд оцього нечуваного в історії людства репресії і сваволі, він є неминучий. Він є неминучий. Я не за кров, не за кровну помсту, вірніше. Я не прибічник Мойсеївських законів. Зуб за зуб, вухо за вухо, кров за кров. Але кінець кінців загнати на той світ мільйони і мільйони людей, котрі не доспівали своєї пісні, не дожили свого життя, і їм просто забути, списати на Сталіна, Їжова, Берію чи ще кого-небудь іншого, то значить бути самому злочинцем.
You've probably never heard of this man. You've probably never heard of his reputation as the second Führer. You've probably never heard of his appalling war crimes, his personal holocaust, his horrific capacity for evil, which drove even deeper a wedge between Serb and Croat in war-torn Yugoslavia. However, if you'd heard that the Vatican helped this man escape justice, you'd want to hear more. The incredible escape of Antti Pavlish, next Thursday at 9 on Channel 4. No objections to Washington as the venue for the... Pay week. army, police teachers or MPs themselves. Yet financial chaos in Moscow will be eclipsed on Sunday as the Ukraine, the largest republic outside Russia itself, looks certain to vote by an overwhelming majority to break from Mr Gorbachev's embryonic new Union of Sovereign States. Even more alarming for Mr Gorbachev are signs that President Bush, for so long committed to shoring up the Soviet leader, is preparing to recognize the Ukraine as an independent nation. Tonight, Mr Bush says there won't be any big breach with the Soviets over his decision to move quickly to recognize the Ukraine. But if Ukraine does now break away, Mr Gorbachev's hopes of holding on to some tattered semblance of central power will break apart too. Few people doubt that the clamour for independence that demonstrators all over the Ukraine have been expressing today will be endorsed in Sunday's vote. In spite of other demonstrations today by pro-communists, people in Kiev tell us tonight that the vote could be a thumping four to one yes to what will be nothing short of a political earthquake in what was the Soviet Union. The industrial and economic might of the second largest republic in the Soviet Union means its breakaway will make the secession of the Baltic states look like a sideshow. Ukrainians also choose a leader on Sunday. And Leonid Kravchuk, the former Communist Party leader, now turned free market enthusiast, is the favorite to top the poll. He is, we hear tonight, coming under mounting attack from the opposition. But their candidates are so divided that they seem unlikely to be able to beat him. This dramatic shift by a republic that only three months ago looked ready to join Gorbachev's new and looser union has come about with breakneck speed. After the Moscow coup, the Ukrainians saw power draining from the center, and they were quick to proclaim independence and promise Sunday's vote. In plotting their future, they now looked not to the old center, but to the new Russia whose leader, Boris Yeltsin, sent his team to Kiev to sign a deal with the Ukraine. But his call for the frontiers to be redrawn to accommodate Ukraine's Russian minority within Russia only spurred the Ukrainians to fend for themselves. And they voted to cream off 400,000 Ukrainians from Soviet forces to establish their own army. And there were even indications that Soviet nuclear weapons on Ukrainian soil would become the new nation's property too. However, they kept Moscow guessing. They showed their ambivalent attitude to the center by signing an economic treaty, but by leaving President Gorbachev in the lurch when they failed to turn up to his attempt at a political treaty that would have formed the basis of his planned union of sovereign states. So now, after 300 years, the government in Kiev looks set to head out on its own. It was here almost a thousand years ago to the day that Grand Duke Vladimir founded the city-state of Rus that gave its name to Russia. And the question that both these huge republics will be asking of each other this weekend is whether they can now live together as peacefully as they did under the cloak of communism. Well, a little earlier I spoke to a leading Ukrainian journalist in Kiev, Alexei Solobienko, and I asked him how total a separation Ukraine wanted from the rest of the Soviet Union. Obviously, the Ukraine would want a political separation from the Soviet Union, not so much the economic separation. Politically, uh, none of the candidates for the presidency of the Ukraine would want any kind of uh, political association with the center. They would want some sort of strategic uh, cooperation, strategic uh, alliance with the Russian Federation, with uh, the other states which used to form the USSR. But there's hardly any chance for the Ukraine to enter in a, into any, uh, any serious type of relationship or the union which would have a binding force on the Ukraine's domestic and foreign policies. But what about those nuclear weapons? In terms of nuclear weapons, Vyacheslav Chernobyl, who has been the uh, number one contender 
uh, with Leonid Kravchuk, the current president of the Supreme Soviet of the Ukraine, was the first to say that the Ukraine should keep the nuclear weapons now uh, until it enters as a full-fledged member of the international community into some sort of international communications. In terms of the uh, situation inside what used to be the Soviet Union and in terms of the counterstanding of the Ukraine versus the Russian Federation, most politicians here uh, prefer to have nuclear weapons as a kind of a gambling chip, as a kind of a uh, trump card in their negotiations so, so that they're treated seriously, so that they're regarded as a nuclear power rather than a smaller brother of a bigger nuclear power. Now, in view of what you've just said about nuclear weapons, are, do you think the chances of Russia and the Ukraine living peacefully side by side are really definitely on? There are many scenarios now for the uh, Ukrainian-Russian relations, uh, but uh, definitely the Russian Federation will not be very happy with the Ukraine going its own way. Uh, there have been some kinds of intimidations, I would call them, on the part of the Russian Federation regarding the borders of the Ukraine. And although the matter was muffled and hushed up for some time, it was an indication of the frictions that will have a much longer lasting effect uh, for the future of uh, the Ukrainian-Russian relations. Does it matter to you how quickly Ukraine gets recognition, if it does vote for independence, how quickly Ukraine gets recognition from the West and America? It is very important for the Ukraine to get international recognition as soon as possible. Uh, this has been a promise of most candidates for the Ukrainian presidency, because all of them said that as soon as the Ukraine uh, votes for independence and uh, attains some sort of international status, uh, most Western powers would recognize it. Alexei Solovyenko from Kiev. Well, authoritative sources in Washington have confirmed today that the USA will indeed give speedy diplomatic recognition to the Ukraine if the referendum goes as expected. President Bush now seems set to lead the West down the road to dealing with the Republic as a genuinely independent entity, so undermining President Gorbachev's dwindling hold on power. Mark Urban examines why Mr Bush has taken that course. When President Bush visited the Ukraine less than four months ago, his government still saw the Republic's independence as a potentially dangerous irritant in America's relations with Moscow. The president pulled no punches when he spoke to Ukrainian representatives. Americans will not support those who seek independence in order to replace a far-off tyranny with a local despotism. They will not aid those who promote a suicidal nationalism based upon ethnic hatred. Today, though, America and up to 25 other countries are apparently on the verge of recognizing the Ukraine's independence, a change brought about not just by the potent political appeal of a democratic referendum, but by the emerging Soviet political crisis. I think the American administration has realized in the last a month or so that the central government in the Soviet Union uh, is indeed collapsing and the future security of the entire region uh, will depend ultimately upon stable Republican governments and for this reason I think the US administration wishes to uh, recognize uh, the Ukrainian government as an independent government when the referendum goes through. The Ukraine has long had the reputation as an agricultural and industrial powerhouse. Even many of the Russians who live in the Republic think they'll be better off outside the Soviet state. In order to keep the Soviet economy afloat, Western countries lent the Union billions of pounds. Now the best way to get it back may be to collect it not from the central authorities, but from individual republics. After the collapse of the August coup, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania seized their opportunity to break free. The outside world granted them diplomatic recognition. Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, having made their own declarations of independence, are fast driving out the remnants of Moscow's influence in the Caucasus. Only the Central Asian republics are willing to remain with Russia in the looser federation which Mr Gorbachev is still struggling to build.
Last week, President Gorbachev suffered a humiliating rebuff in that campaign. Most of the republics boycotted a meeting intended to complete the new Union Treaty. Since the coup, his influence over the republics has diminished by the day. Even his role as the man Western governments prefer to do business with is now in jeopardy. I think the West would certainly like to have given any uh, additional um, strength to Gorbachev's position. We like him. He's, he's, done, he's done us very well in foreign policy and defence policy and so on. I think if we have to leave him, it's because of what's happened to him back in, uh, in, 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 in the Soviet Union. What do you think Britain will do in terms of recognising these other republics? I think they will uh, watch what um, uh, is happening in the Soviet Union very carefully. We will make our assessments on, on how quickly we should or could go. I think there will be a British tendency to try and leave it as late as possible and to try and give the, un <clears throat> the Union some uh, prospect of holding together if it possibly can. But in the end, I think we will go, go and, and, and recognise. Months after the Ukraine's declaration of independence following the failed coup, other countries are about to recognise that move. By doing so, the West must hope that acknowledging this reality early will engage the outside world and so prevent the chaos of a new Yugoslavia. And now from Moscow, I'm joined by Sergei Plekhanov of the US-Canada Institute and uh, from Washington by Richard Pearl, former Assistant Secretary for Defence. Uh, and I'll start with asking, by asking you, if I may, Mr. Pearl, how quickly you would recognise uh, an independent Ukraine. Immediately. That is, as soon as the vote is taken and it's official. It's clear that uh, the overwhelming sentiment in the Ukraine is for independence. No useful purpose would be served now by delaying international recognition of that fact. How do you um, react, Mr. Bikhanov, to uh, what Mr. Pearl has said and what may indeed uh, be something near to what George Bush is about to do? Well, I don't, I don't understand why the U.S. government should be in such a haste as to make such a statement even before the referendum takes place. And it's not just a question of abusing uh, Mr. Gorbachev's sensibility. It's also a question of uh, a major power getting enmeshed in a very complex and uh, conflict-ridden process of separation between two parts of a superpower which have lived together for centuries. Uh, the process which is not likely to be over uh, even after Ukraine becomes independent. The separation process is going to be extremely difficult. And I think uh, outside powers should be more cautious in uh, about about getting involved in that. Mr. Pearl, isn't it important to be very, very careful indeed about wrecking Mr. Gorbachev's chances of forming a union by preempting the uh, referendum on Sunday? Well, I, I think we have been rather careful in the sense that it has been evident now for some time that the union is finished, that there is no longer that minimal desire on the part of the former constituent members of the union to remain together as a single political entity. And even after that became clear, the president, out of deference to Mr. Gorbachev, continued uh, to at least hold open the possibility that a reconstructed uh, union uh, might manage to come out of uh, the, the disintegration. Now it is no longer deniable. And so I think the president waited rather a long time, as it is, before taking uh, the position that uh, the Union cannot be saved. Bluntly, Mr. Bekanov, is the, is the Union finished? The old Union is finished. He ha it has been finished for some time now. I quite agree with Mr. Pearl. The question now is what kind of a transition we're going to have and what kind of a community will exist, community of independent states will exist in peace in the territory of the former Soviet Union. That is what we should think about. And here, relations between countries which used to be parts of a single country, which are tightly integrated, interspersed ethnically, uh, culturally uh, very closely linked to each other, uh, this process is going to be extremely complex. That's why I urge caution. Uh, Mr. Pearl, what did you think? I don't know whether you heard uh, Mr. Solobienko from Kiev a little earlier telling us that um, he was quite convinced that Ukraine's leaders would keep their nuclear weapons and use them, and I quote him, uh, as gambling chips. Does that worry you? 
I, I think that might have been a, uh, a misstatement. I think he probably meant bargaining chips. Well, so maybe he did. It, 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 it made much the same. And, uh, I, I hope that uh, he doesn't mean gambling, and uh, at most he means bargaining, and that this will be a kind of temporary custody as the relationship between uh, Russia and the Ukraine is sorted out. I mean, there were previous indications that the Ukraine wished to be a nuclear-free zone, and clearly it would be in everyone's interest if they revert to that policy uh, after independence. Uh, Mr. Plikhanov, is uh, a nuclear-armed Ukraine uh, playing around with gambling or bargaining chips or whatever you like to call them, something you contemplate with uh, equanimity? Well, I cannot imagine realistically Ukraine and Russia threatening each other with nuclear weapons. In fact, I think uh, both Russia and Ukraine are interested in building a new relationship which would be friendly and cooperative uh, and so on. I, I, I just cannot imagine uh, any, anything, anything other than that. But there will be, of course, problems between the two states. There will be frictions as they settle down into a new relationship. And uh, that's why, that's why uh, attempts of other powers to sort of get involved in the process and uh, uh, try to exert its influence on behalf of one side or the other, I think, could backfire. Mr. Pell, do you recognize at least the dangers there of upsetting a very, a very explosive apple cart? I, mean, I don't think that uh, most American officials would recognize that in extending recognition to the Ukraine, we are somehow involving ourselves in the internal differences, largely because they've come to the conclusion that there isn't enough left to the center to constitute a choice between two sides. It isn't really two sides. It is the tattered remains of the center on the one hand and the clear centrifugal force on the other. Uh, so most American officials, I think, would view this as recognizing the inevitable and not wishing to intervene in any uh, uh, invidious way. Mr. McConnell, finally, would you like to see any country that was contemplating recognizing the Ukraine lay down any conditions for uh, recognizing the full independence of that country? Well, I understand that Mr. Bush is laying down certain conditions and uh, the reports which I've seen indicate that uh, the administration shares the concerns about how the nuclear weapons stations in the Ukraine are going to be used and this bargaining chip thing uh, or gambling chip thing is clearly worrying the administration. So that's, uh, that's a sign of a realistic approach. Uh, uh, Mr. Pearl says that uh, yes indeed uh, recognition is inevitable because the fact of inde independence is almost a fact of life. What worried me a little bit was this hasty statement, even before the referendum was taken. It was clearly an attempt to make a point with the Ukrainians, and uh, that's a little worrisome. Final word, Mr. Pearl. Well, I, I think in the, in the minds of administration officials was the view that if recognition was delayed, that might raise a question as to whether there was a reasonable basis for resisting the claim to recognition, and that could have exactly the kind of uh, inflammatory uh, effect that everyone hopes to avoid, although I think uh, the point is well taken that announcing it before the, uh, the election uh, might fairly be considered hasty. Thank you, Richard Pearl. Thank you, Sergei Blekhanov. Thank you both very Thank much. Thank you. Today. Good night. Thank you. And now, a quick look at the rest of the day's news. The Home Secretary, Kenneth Baker, today became the first cabinet minister to be found... ...is prepared to pay all Soviet state salaries until the end of the year. The Russian president made his offer after attending a crisis meeting at the Kremlin to discuss the Soviet state bank's announcement that it had run out of money. The immediate crisis over who will pay the wages of millions of Soviet state employees has been resolved. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, announced after today's crisis talks that he had agreed to bail the central government out. Russia takes upon itself the entire responsibility for paying wages in the army, science, culture and other central organizations. We guarantee that they'll get their wages. Mr. Yeltsin's price for this apparent generosity was Mr. Gorbachev's agreement to prune back his spending plans. It was the refusal of Mr. Yeltsin's supporters in the Soviet parliament to finance these plans that precipitated the crisis. On Thursday, they blocked massive new loans, which their spokesman described as a blank check for government overspending.
The point is that the centre is a monster that gobbles up huge amounts of money, and we in the republics don't get any benefit from it. The most important outcome of today's talks may be the agreement to combine the Soviet and Russian budgets. This will give Mr Yeltsin effective control over not just his own spending plans, but those of the other 11 Soviet republics, which were not even represented at today's meeting. But Mr Yeltsin's control of the country's finances has not solved the immediate shortage of cash. From Monday, Russian banks have been ordered to stop paying out money from savings accounts. The state is effectively seizing ordinary people's assets in order to have enough cash in hand to pay the wages. Angus Roxburgh, BBC News, Moscow. President Gorbachev has told President Bush in a telephone call that Ukrainian independence would spell disaster for the Republic and for the Soviet Union. His remarks were reported by the Soviet news agency TASS. Tomorrow's referendum in the Ukraine is expected to produce an overwhelming vote in favour of independence. Not everyone here will be voting for Ukrainian independence tomorrow. These people want their republic to stay in the Soviet Union, but it seems they've already lost the argument. Three voters in four are expected to follow the advice of this campaign poster and to break the chain between Kiev and Moscow. Already the Ukraine is creating its own army, simply taking over Soviet military units on its territory. And the Republic is planning to produce its own currency as well, to replace the Russian ruble. But tomorrow, Ukrainians also have to elect a president to take them into independence. And Leonid Kravchuk is the front runner. He's the current leader of the Ukraine, and he has said that he'll never sign Mr. Gorbachev's union treaty, which would create a new Soviet Union. Leonid Kravchuk is immensely popular, especially in the countryside. Yet not long ago, he was a pillar of the Communist Party establishment here, who opposed independence. Now he supports it with all the fervor of a convert. It was one thing to let the tiny Baltic states break free from Moscow, but if the Ukraine goes as well, that will be entirely different. With 53 million people, this republic is the size of a large European state. Mr. Gorbachev knows he cannot afford to lose it. In the end, though, he may have no choice. Ben Brown, BBC News in Kiev. The Tehran Times has said one or two... Ukraine have reported a high turnout in the referendum on whether the Republic should leave the Soviet Union. Opinion polls suggest an overwhelming vote in favour of independence, despite President Gorbachev's warning that it would have disastrous consequences. It looks like most Ukrainians have rejected a last-minute appeal from President Gorbachev to stay in the Soviet Union. At least 70% of voters are expected to have said yes to independence, hoping a decisive majority will force the West, and Washington in particular, to grant diplomatic recognition to the Ukraine, perhaps within weeks. Among those eligible to vote in this referendum were all Soviet soldiers serving here. Many, even those from other republics, said they too had cast their ballots in favour of secession. But the choice today was also for a new Ukrainian president to lead the breakaway from Moscow. The incumbent, Leonid Kravchuk, is firm favourite, and he voted for himself as well as for independence. This evening, election officials are reporting a huge turnout. In this, the biggest exercise in democracy the Ukraine has yet seen. Preliminary results show the vote for independence has been as big as expected. In one polling station, we found yes votes piled up high, compared with only a handful of no's. Tonight, there can be no doubt about the desire of the vast majority of Ukrainians to transform their republic into a new and independent European nation. Like the Baltic states, they know they'll have to keep close economic ties with the Soviet Union, but otherwise they're determined to go it alone. Ben Brown, BBC News, in Kiev. Police in India are still trying... ...show overwhelming support for independence from Moscow. The people have also been voting for their first freely elected president. Presidential front-runner Leonard Kravchuk told reporters today that the world must be ready to recognize an independent Ukraine. And as his citizens flocked to the polls, his victory and a yes to independence seemed assured. That could deal a death blow to what remains of the USSR and lead to Western diplomatic approval for the Ukraine. 
An independent Ukraine would be Europe's largest country, bigger than France or Britain, which have similar populations. 52 million people live there, almost a fifth of the present Soviet total. The Republic provides nearly a quarter of the old Soviet Union's food and coal, a fifth of its machinery and chemicals, but it's the military implications that are immense. 20 Soviet army divisions are based there, together with 176 strategic nuclear missiles and an unknown number of tactical nuclear weapons. And then there's the Black Sea Fleet. Following independence, its fate's not clear. With this arsenal of weapons and soldiers on its territory, Mr. Gorbachev, in his efforts to hold the Union together, is warning of dangerous territorial disputes flaring if the Republic goes it alone. And with Boris Yeltsin's threat that if the Ukraine secedes, Russia won't join the Union either, Ukrainian independence could seriously endanger Mr. Gorbachev. Gorbachev should realize that uh, if he does not have any Union uh, by mid-December, uh, his political career will be finished. Finished too, his vision of the Union, for Ukrainian independence will deal the former Soviet Union a death blow. The fear tonight is that only chaos and instability now looks set to take its place. Penny Marshall, ITN, Moscow. Here, the supermarkets and stores that opened for Sunday trading show overwhelming support for independence from Moscow. The final results from the Soviet Union's second largest republic will be announced later today. This from our Moscow correspondent, Michael Voss. Ukrainians turned out in their millions to vote for independence, rejecting President Gorbachev's warning that a break from Moscow would be a catastrophe for the Union and the world. Most now believe that independence is the only way to achieve a better standard of living. Yenid Kravchuk, with favourite to become the Ukraine's first elected president, says the Republic has no need for the kind of union President Gorbachev is trying to create from the ruins of the old Soviet state. Ukrainian independence could ultimately result in the downfall of Mikhail Gorbachev and his vision of a new Soviet Union. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, has already warned that he won't sign a union treaty without the Soviet's second most powerful republic. The West will be watching the results of the referendum closely. An independent Ukraine would become the largest country in Europe with a powerful military force and a massive stockpile of nuclear weapons. But even if the Republic does break away from the Union, doubts remain as to how quickly foreign governments will recognize it as a truly independent state. Michael Voss, TVAM News, Moscow. The United independence of Ukraine immediately, even if its people do vote to separate from the Soviet Union. Early results in the referendum of the second largest Soviet Republic are expected later today. Ukrainian radio says four-fifths of the population are thought to have voted for independence. The US ambassador in Moscow said that they want clarification about nuclear weapons and debt payments before any moves towards recognition. Our Moscow correspondent Ben Brown reports. There were church services in the Ukraine to celebrate independence even before the polls had closed. No one was in any doubt that the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians would opt for a quick divorce from the Soviet Union. And when the ballot boxes were opened last night, preliminary results showed there had indeed been a huge yes vote in this referendum for independence. Voters had simply ignored Mr. Gorbachev's statement that there cannot be a Soviet Union without the Ukraine, that it would be a disaster for his country, for Europe and for the world. This referendum result means there is now virtually no chance that the Ukraine will sign Mr. Gorbachev's treaty to create a new union of sovereign states. Voters were also choosing a president yesterday and the favorite, Leonid Kravchuk, looks likely to have been victorious. He has campaigned for independence, scoffing at Mr. Gorbachev's claim that secession would be a catastrophe for this republic. Even if Mr. Kravchuk and the Ukrainian leadership had wanted to sign the Union Treaty after all, the public pressure from this referendum will now surely make that impossible. Ben Brown, BBC News, Kiev. The results of another election in the Southern Republic of Kazakhstan are expected to show overwhelming support for the current president, Nursultan Nazarbayev. President Nazarbayev, who was the only candidate in the ballot, said he regarded the vote as a referendum on his plans for free market economic reforms. The Foreign Office Minister Douglas Hogg will be pressing Britain's case for the extradition of... ...have voted by a majority of nine to one to leave the Soviet Union. 
Voters in yesterday's referendum also elected a former Communist Party leader, Leonid Kravchuk, as president. The United States has welcomed the vote, but has stopped short of recognizing the republic. The Ukraine is the most powerful republic after Russia, with a population of 51 million. The result of the referendum is a major blow to President Gorbachev. There were church services across the Ukraine to celebrate independence, even before the results of the referendum. Leonid Kravchuk, who's been re-elected president of the Ukraine, announced that the yes vote in this referendum had been almost nine to one. <laughs> Mr. Kravchuk said that a new nation had been born calmly, as a good child should be born. At the headquarters of Ruch, the Ukrainian nationalist movement, they're warning that much more has yet to be done. This vote uh, will show to the world uh, that Ukraine really wants uh, to be an independent country. Is it an independent country now? Uh, we have declared our independence, uh, but we haven't achieved it yet. For President Gorbachev, the verdict of the people here is a humiliating rejection of his attempts to create a new union of sovereign states. There's virtually no chance now that the Ukraine will join it. And this landslide vote for independence in the second most powerful republic will further erode Mr. Gorbachev's rapidly waning authority. But the Ukraine has its own problems. The food queues were as long as ever today, and the fruit was just as rotten. It will not be easy to go it alone. The Ukraine may be rich compared to the rest of the Soviet Union, but it's poor compared to the rest of Europe. And the people here know they have to improve their economy if they're to survive as an independent nation. Ben Brown, BBC News, in Kiev. New research into the effect of recognizing the Republic as fully autonomous. Leonid Kravchuk the runaway winner of the simultaneous presidential poll is confident that the neighboring Russian Republic will soon acknowledge the Ukraine as independent. According to the Reuters news service, preliminary results from the referendum show that more than 90% of voters said yes to independence. And at least 60% of them are said to have backed Mr. Kravchuk as their leader. His nearest rival polled only 24%. If those results are confirmed, a planned second ballot won't be needed. Our correspondent Gabi Rado reports from the Ukrainian capital Kiev on a poll sending repercussions throughout the old USSR. On a hilltop above the city of Kiev, contrasting images of Ukraine's history. The churches of the Tsarist era and the monument to the Red Army. The theme linking them, Ukraine's subjugation under the Russian Empire. Today, with only fading election posters to distinguish it from any other, Ukrainians went to work as citizens of a new nation. In the referendum, more than 80% of them had voted to end the centuries of rule from Moscow. They also chose as their leader Leonid Kravchuk, the former communist ideology chief, now transformed into a nationalist. I have all grounds to say that new Ukraine was born. Well, so it was born calmly and uh, with uh, good brains as a good child should be born. Though the flag of the new nation fluttered above, there was still a rather forlorn air outside the headquarters of the independence movement, Rook. It was Rook which took the risks in the days when people were jailed for nationalism. But it lost the political battle in the election. Its main candidate, Vyacheslav Chornovil, stayed out of sight today as his supporters summed up the harsh lessons of the campaign. The opposition uh, doesn't have, didn't have an experience um, seriously experience to take party to, to take power sorry and the Bolsheviks uh, had an experience uh, Kravchuk is very clever man uh, he uh, was in his time a leader of the one of leaders of the communist party of Ukraine and but he understood that uh, a destroying of, of the empire is objective process. 
More than 80% of the Ukrainian electorate turned out to vote yesterday, a remarkably high figure, even by the standards of the new democratic elections in East Europe. For the last time, they had to use their Soviet internal passports to obtain their ballot papers. At issue over the weekend was the question of Western recognition of independent Ukraine. Voters here link Western recognition with aid and investment from abroad. I think it will be important. It will help our country to develop its economy and to become a development country and to better our life. If uh, Europe shall fill us as a part of uh, this community and shall show us this, it, it would be a very strong uh, moral stimulation for, for our development. At a news conference announcing early results today, one of those invited was Michael Holmes, who's soon to be Britain's first consul in Kiev. He was not allowed to go on record on the day EEC foreign ministers were considering recognition of Ukraine, deciding finally to take the cautious American line. But the establishment of a new British consulate in the Ukrainian capital proves the interest London now has in the Republic. Western business has already started to show its interest. The US household products giant Johnson has opened a factory in Kiev making cleaning agents and shampoo. The needs of consumers have been neglected to such an extent here that this is thought to be the first factory in the whole of the former Soviet Union devoted to making household products. In the past year, productivity has risen by 85%. We looked at seven different sites around the Soviet Union before we decided on a final location and we chose the Ukraine uh, because of its central location, a large population, over 52 million, and uh, the people here have been very, very responsive to our presence. A new Ukrainian currency is being printed in Canada for introduction next year. If Western investment is to take off, the new Grivna needs to become convertible, and no one at present can guarantee that. As voting day flags come down and the dreams of independence become reality, the Ukraine now faces hard economic decisions. The first will be on her relations with the old Union. Mr. Gorbachev will tonight be hoping that now Leonid Kravchuk has secured his victory, the fierce anti-Moscow rhetoric of his campaign will be quietly forgotten. Mr. Kravchuk, above all a pragmatist, needs Washington, and Washington has now indicated it will only recognize the Ukraine once issues such as nuclear weapons and foreign debt find an all-union solution. It is in fact Mr. Gorbachev's last remaining hope. Gabirado, ITN, Kiev. A reminder of the main news so far, there have been renewed calls by the opposition for the resignation of the... ...quality of almost nine to one. The result is a big setback for Mr Gorbachev and his efforts to form a union of sovereign states. The Ukraine has always been known as the Soviet Union's breadbasket. Its population of over 51 million people produce nearly 20% of the Soviet Union's food. The Republic has large oil, gas and coal reserves and a sizable nuclear industry, including nuclear weapons. There were church services across the Ukraine to celebrate independence, even before the results of the referendum. For more than 300 years, the Ukraine has effectively been ruled from Moscow. Now its people are saying unequivocally that they've had enough. Leonid Kravchuk, who's been re-elected president of the Ukraine, announced that the yes vote in this referendum had been almost nine to one. Mr. Kravchuk said that a new nation had been born calmly, as a good child should be born. He said he expects the Russian Federation to recognize Ukrainian independence soon. He's also optimistic that Western countries will do so, but for that he'll probably have to wait. At the headquarters of Ruch, the Ukrainian nationalist movement, they're warning that much more has yet to be done. This vote uh, will show to the world uh, that Ukraine really wants uh, to be an independent country. Is it an independent country now? Uh, we have declared our independence, uh, but we haven't achieved it yet. 
For President Gorbachev, the verdict of the people here is a humiliating rejection of his attempts to create a new union of sovereign states. There's virtually no chance now that the Ukraine will join it. And this landslide vote for independence in the second most powerful republic will further erode Mr. Gorbachev's rapidly waning authority. But the Ukraine has its own problems. The food queues were as long as ever today and the fruit was just as rotten. It will not be easy to go it alone. The Ukraine may be rich compared to the rest of the Soviet Union, but it's poor compared to the rest of Europe. And the people here know they have to improve their economy if they're to survive as an independent nation. Ben Brown, BBC News, in Kiev. The government has said the new national tests for seven-year-olds will constitute for full independence. The vote effectively scuppers President Gorbachev's attempt to retain the Union. Canada, Poland and Boris Yeltsin's Russian Republic have recognized the Ukraine's independence. On the markets today, the... ...issued a dire warning about the breakup of the Soviet Union. He said it would bring the threat of civil war and would be a catastrophe for the world. He's urged the remaining republics to sign a new treaty of confederation. President Gorbachev made no mention of Ukraine's vote this week for independence. President Gorbachev's empire is dwindling before his eyes. The Ukraine's overwhelming vote for independence at the weekend dealt a mortal blow to his hopes of holding his disintegrating country together. In a starkly worded letter bearing his personal signature, he's delivered to the country's MPs an apocalyptic warning of wars and catastrophe if the Soviet Union's former republics don't come together. But with the Ukraine under its new president, Leonid Kravchuk, bent on full independence, the prospects for the Union Treaty, which Mr Gorbachev wanted the republics to sign by the end of the year, have never looked bleaker. Mr Kravchuk wants direct agreements with other republics, like the one he signed earlier this year with the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin. The two men will meet with the leader of a third republic, Belarusia, at the weekend to begin moves towards a loose partnership of states modelled on the European community, with no role for a super state headed by Mr Gorbachev. The chances of the breakaway republics heeding Mr Gorbachev's warnings of catastrophe look small, and that leaves the architect of Perestroika surveying the ruins of the country he's tried so doggedly to preserve. Soviet television has so far only summarized Mr. Gorbachev's emotional appeal for unity, but the president himself will address the nation in an hour's time. He's expected to make a last-ditch appeal to save the Union and his own political future. Angus Roxborough, BBC News, Moscow. Later in this news, the television commercial that aims to frighten damage and could lead to wars. It would doom the Soviet people to a miserable existence, he said. Twelve republics are being asked to sign the new treaty, including, crucially, the Ukraine, which voted overwhelmingly for independence at the weekend. Mr Gorbachev said he was for a new confederate democratic union of states. Mr Gorbachev's fierce and emotional plea for the union is almost certainly too late. His choice of language and political reasoning lagging far behind the nationalist sentiments already tearing the former Soviet Union apart. People have had enough of unions. They associate it with the old repressive system. They want no more of it. And this, I think, tragically leaves Mr Gorbachev stranded high and dry, a president without a union. Broadcast to all the republics simultaneously, tonight's speech was a last desperate attempt to secure support for the Union Treaty. Only the Union can protect us from tragedy, he warned, from war and economic chaos. Disintegration would be a catastrophe for the whole international community. His appeal follows the landmark pro-independence referendum in the Ukraine this weekend. Newly elected President Leonid Kravchuk today announcing immediate negotiations with Russia and Belarus the three powerful Slav republics bypassing the Soviet president and his crumbling central government. Tonight, Mr Gorbachev's spokesman confirmed to ITN that his president was closer to resigning than ever before. I think he may resign. He said that quite clearly, that unless his idea of the new Confederate state is not supported, he wouldn't follow uh, the, the project and he would uh, leave his place to, to the others. And as the politicians argue, Moscow's pensioners queue for German food aid. Underlying this political crisis is an economic calamity which deepens by the day.
Tonight, we are witnessing not just the death throes of the Soviet Union, but the beginning of a much more dangerous process, the country's disintegration. Penny Marshall, News at 10, Moscow. The Education Secretary, Mr. Kenneth Clark, has ordered a big inquiry into... Country. Well, this is perhaps an event which has gone a little bit unnoticed this week with the release of the hostages and one thing and another, but it, um, <clears throat> one commentator dis described it as equal in impact to the dismantling of the Berlin Wall. Christine Crawley. Well, I think, on, on the whole, we've been a bit, uh, a bit too passive in our reaction. We obviously have to, to be careful, but you have now a country with over 50 million people, twice the size of Germany. Uh, the people in that country have declared that they want uh, self-election and they want self-determination, and Therefore, I think what we have to be looking to now is how we, as a, a member of the European community and uh, as, as a, a, a sovereign country too, how we can ensure that what is happening there is a contribution to world peace and not a threat. And I'm talking about the fact, as we all know, that there are 180 nuclear missiles stationed in the Ukraine. And we have to, I'm an old CND campaigner, and uh, I, I, I've always felt that proliferation is the real problem that we face, nuclear proliferation. And I think it's very important that we try, along with our other EC partners, to um, get in there to advise, to try to help. Um, the, the, there's perhaps talk of some new modern uh, Marshall Plan, some way of not allowing the Ukraine to feel isolated but recognising that problems come with uh, countries becoming uh, uh, sovereign countries uh, having been in, in a federation. It's so, conceivable they could apply for membership mm. of the European community. Indeed, they've, they've talked about that, yes. And, and Wouldn't it be a good idea not to make it more complicated in the meantime? That there, are, there are associate members of the European community already uh, coming up. There's Hungary and Poland, Czechoslovakia. They want associate membership of the European community. And I, I think we have to be looking at how we can cooperate with the Ukraine, how we can um, stop the worst and most threatening effects of nationalism arising and keep very close eye on the fact that there is a great concentration of nuclear weapons in that country. Thank you very much. Howard Davis. Yes, I recently played football against a team of London Ukrainians and went joined them in their club afterwards and there was no doubt about their views on independence. Indeed, they were very independent, indeed rather aggressive too, I regret to say. But um, In the game? I th yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, the way they play uh, sport, I think. Um, I think that the breakup of the Soviet Union is an absolutely critical event in the history of the 20th century. And it's one which we, on the edges of it have to handle with great caution. It's alarming to be in, in Moscow, as I was a couple of months ago, and to watch a society and an economy in the process of disintegrating. I think this is something which the community ought to be able to take on, and I very much hope that the community will be up to the task. I think what is needed is to offer a realistic route into the community for the nations of Eastern Europe and for the growing independent republics in the Soviet Union, which has a realistic timetable, which they, and there's no question that Ukraine could join the common market tomorrow. It is quite impossible, and nor Russia, if you look at the state of their economy. Is it, would it be a mistake to, be... to rush towards a single currency if these countries in Eastern Europe may be on their way into the common well, market? I think that it would not be a mistake, because I think that we need to offer, and what they are interested in, is a deep community with strong links between them, and not a very loose uh, grouping of states. That is the attraction to them, I think, that we have a strong community with a developing union. But I agree that we need to offer them staging posts along the road, and not erect a hurdle which looks so impossibly high that they cannot jump over it. I don't believe that that should be beyond the wit of the leaders of the community to devise. And I hope when we've got all this Maastricht stuff out of the way, we can get onto that, which is a more important job. Julian Shepherd. Um, Howard mentions Maastricht. I must just get this in because I read this this week and it was a, a little quote from France and it said, three out of four French people don't know what Maastricht is, where it is and nor do they know that there are IGCs going on next week. <laughs> That's in brackets. 
Um, but the enlargement of the European community mm. is certainly um, something that we have to bear in mind when we're looking uh, at this overwhelming vote for independence that has taken place in the Ukraine, 90 percent, I think. I mean, there's absolutely no question um, about the desire of the people of the Ukraine uh, to become independent. We need uh, to use the EC and we need to use our allies uh, to work uh, together to encourage countries like Ukraine, I think, to achieve a successful independence. It will be necessary for them, obviously, to respect uh, the commitments of debt and the commitments with regard to the nuclear weapons, as Christine has said, uh, that they inherit from the Soviet Union. And I also read uh, that they have plans to raise an army of half a million people, which might be quite an expensive thing to start off by doing. But our question um, was, though, what, at what stage do we recognise Ukraine as an independent and sovereign country? I think this is something that we've got to work uh, with our allies and partners um, together uh, to um, give as much help as possible to work with people from the Ukraine. Uh, I don't think that I personally could say at what stage we could, uh, because I'm not very um, informed about exactly how independent economically the Ukraine could be at this moment. I think there needs to be uh, a lot of help given, a lot of discussion, a lot of know-how fund, a lot of cooperation to help the Ukraine and the other new nations who are moving towards independence, towards democracy in such a very important step and let's hope we can welcome, welcome them into the EC. Tony Benn. Well, this is the second European question we've had tonight, and I hope you've noticed the different answers. I mean, there's been a referendum in the Ukraine, so now we're told we've got to take seriously what the Ukraine thinks. And uh, they want a separate currency. Nobody says they haven't got an alternative. But, uh, of course, we sent an army into Russia in 1920 to destroy the revolution. And I came across Winston Churchill's memorandum to the Cabinet. It's published in his book, The World Crisis, The Aftermath, in which he said to the Cabinet, we must never let the Ukraine be split from Russia, and would you please tell General Denikin, the white Russian leader, to stop all the anti-Semitism. Now, what I think we're witnessing in Eastern Europe now is a recreation of what happened in Europe as a whole before the war. I'm old enough to remember Pilsudski, Mannerheim, King Carol, King Zog, uh, King Michael, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco. We're going back, and, and fascism is growing. And anti-Semitism is growing. What we've got to do is to find some method of working for cooperation in Europe that doesn't enforce from the top a particular pattern. Now, I mentioned earlier my Commonwealth of Europe bill. I'm presenting it on Monday, it happens. But my warning is this. If we go to try and impose capitalism by a commission in Brussels, it'll come unstuck like the attempt to impose communism by the Central Committee in Moscow. And my fear is that it will lead to the sort of nationalism that we're seeing in the Ukraine. You've got to let people develop according to their religious, historical, cultural nature and cooperate. And I think the lessons of Eastern Europe, if I may say so, point towards a much looser arrangement in Western Europe. And I say that as a good European, because I don't, we can't say what the Ukrainians will do, but if they do decide to be independent, we've got to work with them just as the Europeans, Western Europeans, would have to work with us if we decided we want a looser system. Well, so were you, were you least... saying that the world is becoming just as unstable as it was, say, before the First World War? No, what I'm saying is that uh, what we're seeing in Eastern Europe is not the growth of democracy, but possibly, and I think this is a serious risk, mm. you'll get a sort of third world military dictatorship type of capitalism. That's what I fear in Russia. I think that in the end, there'll be such chaos, the army will move in and try and run capitalism there, the way which, oh, I don't know, General Pinochet did in Chile. And I don't, when Mrs. Thatcher once said that when the first McDonald's hamburger joint opened in Moscow, this was a proof democracy had arrived. Well, I've never equated <laughs> democracy with McDonald's hamburger, and I'm not making fun of her. What we're witnessing are anti-communist dictatorships, separatism, fascism, anti-Semitism, and we've got to find a form for Europe that allows us all to be different and work together. So when do we recognise the Ukraine? Well, I'm only saying if the Ukraine choose to be independent, we've got to find a pattern that lets them fit into Europe without feeling threatened. And we've got to fit, find a pattern that doesn't threaten us. And I think if you could see it only in a broader way, you'd never go along the route to Maastricht any more you'd go along the route to Stalin's Russia. Now, that's my conviction. Thank and you I very think much. a lot of people share it. <laughs> <coughs> Mr.
<laughs> Mr. Gresko, can I take it you're a Ukrainian? I am. Ah, I what's your, what do you I think of what you've heard from, from these four people? Sorry, can I just go back to Mr. Ben? You seem to have forgot Stalin, the greatest dictator who killed millions of our own people through uh, a famine in the 30s. Um, as yeah. far as the nuclear argument is concerned, Let's not forget Chernobyl. I don't think Ukrainian yes, right. will um, be playing around with nuclear weapons after the event of Chernobyl. Uh, and of course, I would, it's, it's a great, great news to see my country independent after over 70 years of imperialistic dictatorship. Thank you very much. Let's hear some, is there another view? <laughs> Lady at the back. Lady in blue. I, I wonder whether with the Ukrainian um, situation, they're economically probably viable and able to become independent. Shouldn't our concerns be with those parts of Russia that are not able to be independent and will become a, a responsibility of the world, hopefully? Thank you very much. Is there another view? G gentleman there in the leather jacket. Yeah, I just feel uh, it's incredible uh, with socialism in demise all over the world that we might ha be electing a Labour government in this country. Well, uh, that's not really to do with the Ukraine. That's for you. Um, that's for you. Gentlemen there. I think for the first time I'm actually in agreement with Tony Benn. Um, there are with... millions like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But if Europe goes down a centralist federal alley, um, won't the Ukrainians feel that if they enter into Europe that they're actually going backwards rather than forwards? Hmm. Who wants to have a stab how, at that? How, quick, quick answer on that. Let, let's, let's look at how the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Greeks felt about membership of the European community. They suffered dictatorships very recently and they saw their membership of the European community as a way of um, strengthening their democracies. And they'll tell you that. My Greek and Spanish and Portuguese friends will say that becoming members of the European community, being able to cooperate on democratic policies was one of the ways that they were able to escape from fascism. Thank you. How, Davis? I think that one of the main attractions for the newly independent republics in the Soviet Union is the prospect of a link with a Europe uh, which removes the possibility of a European war. I don't think that they are particularly concerned at this stage about the social charter or the single currency. What we've got to do is open their door and say that in the long run we want you in the European family of nations. That's the key message that must be delivered now, I think. Thank you very much. In the last five minutes of question time, we'll take another question from Jan Berry, who is a police officer. Thank you. Does the panel consider... Tonight, the civil war in Yugoslavia would look like a simple joke compared to any further disintegration of the Soviet Union. His comments came after the leaders of Russia, Belio Russia and the Ukraine said they were creating a Commonwealth of Independent States. Today's historic agreement marks the formal death of the Soviet Union. Boris Yeltsin and the other Slav republics ending Mr Gorbachev's vision of a wider political union. Now these three mighty republics, the Ukraine, Russia and Belarus, which make up 70% of the former Soviet Union's population, have gone it alone. Without Mr Gorbachev, without Moscow, but with their nuclear arsenals situated on their territories intact. That leaves Mr Gorbachev isolated, a president without a union. Tonight, as speculation mounted that he may yet resign, he warned that the disintegration of the Soviet Union would make Yugoslavia's civil war look like a simple joke in comparison. This evening, there was angry reaction from the Central Asian republics left out. Nurzultan Nazarbayev, president of Kazakhstan, flew into Moscow, warning of the nuclear risk in a disintegrating Soviet Union. He's due to meet President Gorbachev and the three Slav leaders in Moscow tomorrow. But there's little, if anything, left to discuss after today's announcement. For Boris Yeltsin and the Slav republics have a future, Mr Gorbachev almost certainly does not. Penny Marshall, ITN, Moscow. Libya's forum and Belarus. After the discovery of more... Up ...after three of its most powerful republics agreed to form their own Commonwealth of Independent States. The leaders of Russia, Ukraine and Belarusia will meet President Gorbachev for talks today after signing agreements on economic reform, foreign and military policy. The Commonwealth will be based in the Belarusian capital of Minsk, not Moscow. The move virtually ends Gorbachev's rule and he could resign. He's warned the possible violence caused by the Soviet Union's disintegration would make Yugoslavia's civil war look a simple joke in comparison. 
Police fear more fire... President Gorbachev's position this morning looks more uncertain than ever. His Soviet Union appears to be facing total disintegration. Boris Yeltsin and the leaders of the two other republics who formed a commonwealth of independent states with him say that the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics ceases its existence. The new commonwealth links the Russian Federation, the Ukraine and Belarusia, 70% of the Soviet population. Its capital is Minsk. The three states will have a joint defense policy and there'll be joint control of nuclear weapons. Mr Gorbachev now seems to have little left but his title. From Moscow, our correspondent Angus Roxborough. If his interview on Soviet television last night is anything to go by, President Gorbachev will be in fighting mood when he meets the leaders of the four biggest republics today. I've not lost the battle yet, he said, warning of anarchy and chaos if the country is allowed to disintegrate. But a long weekend of talks in this forest hideaway appears already to have put an end to Mr Gorbachev's hopes. Meeting behind the Soviet president's back, the leaders of Russia, the Ukraine and Belarusia declared the Soviet Union non-existent and set up a new commonwealth of independent states. The three leaders, all of whom have nuclear weapons on their territories, reassured the West that they would retain joint control over their strategic arsenals. The leader of Kazakhstan, also a nuclear power, has already arrived in Moscow for today's talks. He'll be invited to join the new commonwealth but it's not at all clear whether Mr Gorbachev will be asked to head it. Angus Roxborough, BBC News, Moscow. Here, a new battle to save his political life said tonight he wants to convene the Supreme Soviet Legislature to discuss the Commonwealth of Independent States formed by the three most powerful Soviet republics. The move leaves Mr Gorbachev more isolated than ever, but Mr Yeltsin tells him you can still be useful. The report next. Plus, Israel's most is swap me for missing Israelis and Oxford United <music> President Mikhail Gorbachev is fighting to stop the Soviet Union and his job from disappearing tonight the Kremlin said today Mr Gorbachev wouldn't resign over the formation of the new Commonwealth of Russia Belarusia, and the Ukraine in a statement read out on Soviet television, Mr. Gorbachev said the assertion by the leaders of the three republics that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist was illegal and dangerous. He wants the decision about the new Commonwealth to be referred to the Congress of People's Deputies. Mr. Gorbachev swept into the Kremlin this morning, vulnerable and politically isolated, the president of a country that no longer exists. Tonight on national television, it was left to the newscaster to read out Mr. Gorbachev's response to the breakaway Slav Commonwealth. The president himself battling on inside the Kremlin as Moscow approached midnight. And if Boris Yeltsin and his Slav allies thought Gorbachev would concede defeat easily, they were wrong. He's fighting back calling an all-union referendum and a meeting of the top Soviet lawmaking body, the Congress of People's Deputies, to decide the fate of the Union. With high irony, he's trying to use the governing bodies of a dead Soviet Union to bring it back to life. On the other side, Boris Yeltsin strode into the Kremlin today to confront him. Meanwhile, Leonard Kravchuk in the Ukraine held up the document declaring the Soviet Union dead. There's no going back now, he declared. The Russian foreign minister even offered Mr. Gorbachev a leading role in the new Commonwealth. It can be a very important and positive role uh, since Gorbachev initiated change in this part of the world and if he goes on as a promoter of this change then his role will be uh, even increasing. Mr Gorbachev's one Republican ally, Kazakhstan's Nezultan Nazarbayev, stood by him today. His support is crucial, for after the three mighty Slav republics, Kazakhstan is the only one of economic significance. This political turmoil will, of course, only serve to heighten the economic chaos. Anger already spilling over in the empty shops of Moscow. Hardliners like Colonel Viktor Auxnis tonight warned that the army was ready to step in. Mr. Gorbachev may have survived today, but the three Slav republics have all the economic might, and Mr. Gorbachev's rejection of their commonwealth has only served to make the process of disintegration here more dangerous. Penny Marshall, News at 10, 
Moscow. It's the question of what will happen to all this that worries the West. The vast weaponry of the old Soviet Union, conventional and nuclear, could it be used by one new republic against another? Trying to answer that question has sent a shiver through the centers of power in the Western world. We really do run the risk, in my view at least, of seeing a, uh, a situation uh, created there not unlike what we have seen in Yugoslavia uh, with nukes, with nuclear weapons thrown in, and that could be an extraordinarily uh, dangerous uh, situation for uh, Europe and for the rest of the world, indeed for the United States. That alarmist view stems from fear that central control of nuclear weapons will break down. There are 27,000 nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union, 70% in Russia, 15% in the Ukraine, and 5% in Bielorussia. The weapons range from long-range strategic missiles, some submarine-launched, to bombs and artillery shells. Soviet Chief of Staff General Lobov, visiting a British submarine base last week, gave assurances tight central control of nuclear weapons would be maintained, but he was sacked as soon as he got home. Such sudden change fuels the West's concerns, not so much over control of the strategic missiles in fixed silos, but of the smaller tactical nuclear weapons like these. Tactical nuclear warheads, of which there are many more, battlefield nuclear warheads is another name, have in some cases very simple mechanical locks, and it would not be beyond the wit of man, given time, to unscramble those locks. So it would be possible, theoretically, for a terrorist organization or even for an individual republic to steal or use some of the tactical nuclear warheads on their soil in these depots, reprogram them and use them for battlefield purposes. In the Ukraine, individual Red Army units have already switched loyalties to the Ukrainian Republic. Could nuclear forces follow suit? The new Commonwealth leaders say no because they plan joint control of all nuclear forces. All of the republics have, uh, will have to have a say in it. I think it, uh, a much safer system can be created. I, I think here you don't have uh, to have serious troubles. The West will welcome the republic's good intentions over controlling nuclear weapons, but will watch anxiously to see if they can be put into effect. Sheikh obeyed. The Lebanese cleric held the size of armies, debts, uh, then you're well away, you're well on the way to recognition. And that's a line which all the Europeans here and the Americans have taken. So if they make a declaration on that, we're prepared to recognize them? Well, I mean, the declaration, they have to show that these obligations are being accepted. We're, right. not in the business, a... we're not in the business of saying to the Ukraine, you're not independent, we're not going to recognize you. But we are saying, you can't behave like the Bolsheviks did in 1917 and say the obligations of the Tsar are nothing to do with us. Well, what's a reasonable period? That remains to be judged. But I don't think that myself there'll be a huge difficulty about it because the first reactions they've uh, made uh, have been uh, very constructive. So you'd anticipate it within, what, six months, a year, two oh, years? Oh, yes, yes, I would. Within indeed, six months? Indeed, or even a shorter time. Now, can we turn to, to what's been going on here in Maastricht? The of the old Soviet Union inexorably gathered pace. Posterity will judge which event should be marked out in the history books, the birth of a new federal state of Europe or the final collapse of an old one. This morning, the leaders of the EC's two nuclear powers, Mr. Major and President Mitterrand, met to discuss the West's growing alarm over the future of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Meanwhile, Mr. Gorbachev was describing the creation of the new Slavic Commonwealth of Russia, Belarusia and the Ukraine as illegal and dangerous. The fate of our multinational country cannot be decided by the will of three Republican leaders. He said he would convene the Soviet Parliament and might call a referendum. But how much authority remains with Mr. Gorbachev? And how is the new Commonwealth created yesterday going to address the dire economic and social problems the old Union was facing? Julia O'Halloran reports. When Boris Yeltsin arrived at the Kremlin this morning, he was representing a new entity, the Slavic Commonwealth of Russia, Bielorussia and the Ukraine. He came not with an ultimatum to Mr. Gorbachev, but a fait accompli. Like it or lump it, the union of former communist republics is dead. Long live the Commonwealth of independent Slavic nations. 
At a hunting lodge near Brest, close to the border with Poland yesterday, the leaders of Russia, Belarusia and Ukraine made a memorable declaration that the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a subject of international law and a geopolitical reality has ceased to exist. This was how the Ukrainian leader, Leonid Kravchuk, summed it up today. We, the leaders of the republics of Belarusia, the Russian Federation and the Ukraine, declare that the negotiations for the creation of the new union have come to a clear end and the process of the republics leaving the Soviet Union and the creation of independent states has become a reality. The short-sighted policy of the center has led to political and economic chaos. The Russian vice president, Gennady Bobolis, told foreign journalists there'd be no alternative to forming the new Commonwealth. At the Minsk meeting, they decided to take a look at reality and deal with the hypocrisy of the present leadership. It was unanimously decided that this was the only possible step which will allow us to get out of the dead end that we find ourselves in at present. Boris Yeltsin had told the Belarusian parliament in Minsk that Mr. Gorbachev's proposed union treaty was problematical without the Ukraine, which voted for independence a week ago. Mr. Gorbachev, meanwhile, had, Knut-like, been repeating that the union still existed, that it could not be destroyed by the stroke of a pen, that power remained with him at the center. This process must be stopped. We are at the frontier. Beyond this frontier lie anarchy and chaos. I cannot keep this from the people. They must know about it. Even as a union, we will have great difficulty in overcoming the disintegration that has occurred, not only in the economy, but in society as well. It seems that with the three leaders of the biggest republics of the former Soviet Union, Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine, now saying that the Soviet Union doesn't exist, then really they are the ones who hold all the cards. And I think Mr. Gorbachev is going to have to realize very soon that the Soviet Union, in fact, does not exist anymore. Whatever Mr. Gorbachev's precise status, the new Commonwealth must also face its own problems. Forming an economic community was a crucial part of yesterday's agreement between the Slavic nations. Between them, they have 73% of the former Soviet population, but 85% of its industrial production. They are linked together. They have very good economic relations. They have the same problems. Uh, it's better to harmonize their economic reforms in all these three republics. As for the others, I think they also, in the near future, join this uh, new structure, new union. Otherwise, it will be much difficult for them to survive in this economic situation. The immediate question facing the Slavic leaders, though, is whether they can feed their people as the system falls apart and starvation threatens. It's too early to say whether they definitely have improved their chances of feeding their people. It does show, though, political will. The problem may be that it's come at the wrong time of year. Winter is already upon the former Soviet Union, and it's a very bad time to try and start uh, dis distributing food, making sure it gets to where it's needed. So perhaps they would have been better off if they'd done this back in the summer. For the outside world, it's still the issue of nuclear weapons that is most alarming. An independent Ukraine would be, in theory, the world's third nuclear power, with about 4,000 warheads on its soil. But the Ukrainian leader said today that buttons would have to be pressed at once by all three member nations to activate the nuclear weapons. However, Kazakhstan, with 1,800 warheads on its territory, is not in the Commonwealth and could prove a headache, despite the stated intention of its leaders that it should not be a nuclear power. Kazakhstan does raise particularly serious questions because, of course, it's basically a Muslim republic as well. It's not a Slavic republic. Now, Mr Nazarbayev, the president of Kazakhstan, has said for the time being that he doesn't want to join. 
Now, if he doesn't join and if he doesn't give up his nuclear weapons, then are we going to have a, a Muslim republic with nuclear weapons? That's a very frightening prospect. Another layer of potential insecurity for the Slavic Commonwealth is that of minorities within its boundaries. For example, the Crimean Tatars, who've protested over their fate frequently. Expelled by Stalin from the Black Sea Peninsula to Central Asia and Siberia, they've recently been returning. The Tatars, who once had their own autonomy, have no wish to be in the Ukraine, where they are now. Nor do many of the Crimea's Russians. And the Commonwealth has many more minority problems. Unfortunately, these conflicts are not only likely, they are already taking place in and around the regions lived in by the smaller minorities. This is to the detriment of the neighboring peoples. And we have got to strive to find a peaceful solution to these conflicts. That is the problem for the Russian government. Ordinary people in Moscow have been reacting to the new Commonwealth with caution, scepticism or mere resignation. One old woman said she'd lived under the Tsar, then under the revolution, now she'd live under the Commonwealth. Another said simply, let them give us something to eat. Well, with me now is Andrei Orlov, the former political editor of TASS. Andrei Orlov, isn't what's happened in the last uh, 24 hours, in constitutional terms, the toppling of Mr Gorbachev? Yes, it might amount to that. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev has been called many times the great Houdini of our times by the Western media. Uh, and for the last three years, I, all I have been doing is uh, predicting when actually Mr. Gorbachev was going to resign. This time it seems uh, that it's very close to that. But uh, the recent developments in uh, Belarus leave so many questions unanswered that it's a bit too early to say whether Mr. Gorbachev is actually going to resign. And then uh, his answer is going to be crucial. But he says he's not going to resign. He says he's not going to resign, and he has uh, one tramp card in, up his sleeve. That's a referendum, probably uh, calling on the people to uh, to make make their vote on on the future of the former Soviet Union. Do you think that there will actually be a referendum, as he's talked about today? Well, it's quite mm. difficult to imagine, honestly. Uh, it's quite a costly thing, and uh, then it. A, a much more uh, degree of unity of the former country is needed to do that. In very general terms, I might say that there are good things and bad things about yesterday's and today's developments in, in Belarus. Uh, in general, I might say it's a clear victory for Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, it's a clear defeat for Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Nazarbayev, who has been Mr. Gorbachev's and Mr. Yeltsin's ally, and quite a dubious uh, result for Mr. Yeltsin himself, who swapped his ally, Mr. Nazarbayev, for a new ally, Mr. Kravchuk. Whether that's a good step or not, only time will tell. Why do you think Mr. Yeltsin, in particular, moved now? Well, I think uh, ever since uh, Ukrainians uh, declared its independence, Ukrainian problem has been one biggest headache for Mr. Yeltsin. Uh, why? So, can, you, can you explain why? Well, because uh, Ukraine is the only Soviet Republic comparable to Russia uh, in size and population and wealth and nuclear weapons. So having to compete with Ukraine for Western help, for Western uh, recognition, for influence, for whatever, might be quite, quite dangerous for Russia and uh, quite to, n to the detriment of, uh, of Russia. Now, both Mr. Gorbachev and uh, James Baker uh, in America have been talking about a possible civil war with uh, nuclear arms thrown in. How great a danger do you think there is of that happening? Well, I, I must say that no matter how dire predictions are, they are not accurate or dire enough to reflect the situation. I'm quite pessimistic about the prospects of the, Sov of the former Soviet Union. And uh, the dangerous thing about yesterday's Commonwealth announcement is that it leaves open the possibility of a Muslim Commonwealth, which, is, which, which might seem a natural thing for people like Mr. Nazarbayev and others. Mr. Nazarbayev has been woving uh, quite a delicate fabric of relationship between uh, Russia and his Muslim republics. He has been serving as a useful bridge between them. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, the recent Mr. Yeltsin's uh, move leaves him no real possibility but to join the others. 
and try to become a real uh, superpower in the uh, Muslim world of the former Soviet Union. Mind you, we have uh, Iran and uh, other Muslim countries quite near. So that's a frightening possibility. Andrei Olov, thank you very much indeed. Now, the problems being thrown up by the collapse of the Soviet Empire are causing deep disquiet in the West. Mr. Gorbachev's warning that the breakup of the Union could end by making Yugoslavia's civil war look like a joke, and that's been echoed by the American Secretary of State, James